every once in a while um, at, at my house, there are several puzzles being put together on the floor. Big puzzles, usually it's uh, when they find out that Puzzle Day, National Puzzle Day is near. All the kids break out the old giant puzzles and put them together. Uh, we don't very often do the thousand piece puzzles, but uh, my mother-in-law, uh, or my in-laws at her house, uh, they do that. And so my kids help there as well. And I, I learned a trick and I'm going to tell you, um, maybe, maybe confess at the moment. Uh, but here's a trick to complete any puzzle. You watch and wait while everybody's putting it together. You come around when no one's looking and take a piece of the puzzle and then continue to watch and wait and uh, you can go do your own thing. When you find out they're almost done but they can't find the last piece, you walk in and set it in place and say, it is finished. I've done it. Look what I did. The kids have figured that trick out, and they know if there's a puzzle piecing, a puzzle piece missing, they will come and find me and say, "Where's, where's the puzzle piece? We're almost done. We're trying to, we're trying to do this, Dad." More often than not, each one of them has taken their own piece and put it in their pocket, so it never gets done. But today we're going to look at something that is much more complex than a puzzle, and much more great than a puzzle, a plan that God had been working since before the foundation of the world. Of the seven statements from the cross, of those seven cross words, if you look at the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, they include one of those statements. Luke includes three, and John includes three. In John, Jesus' words, when he says them, uh, begin when his loved ones are standing by, and they all have something in common. If you open to John chapter 19, verses 26 and 30, as we read, see if you notice what these verses have in common, what Jesus' statements have in common. Verse 26 of John chapter 19 says, When Jesus saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar, of, uh, a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put it on a sponge. Uh, full of the sour wine. Uh, they put that on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He spoke in order to finish his personal responsibilities to this world. He spoke to fulfill or to finish the scriptures. And he spoke a third time in John to declare it is finished. And as you look through John, and many of the gospels also bear this out, it is as if everything has been leading up to this moment. I, I remember uh, uh, one night I wanted to watch um, Mission Impossible, but not the movie, the old TV series. And I, 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 it's older than I am. I haven't seen very many of them, but I know it has the same theme song. And as it's coming on, somebody lights a fuse. You know, and that fuse is running through all of the uh, opening credits. That's, that's how I remember it. I might be remembering it wrong. And it's going through, you know what happens when the fuse reaches the bomb? It explodes. And as we look at Jesus' life, as it's getting closer and closer to this moment, we see the fuse shortening and shortening. And uh, as Rolf in his class, class this morning mentioned, uh, everything is focused on one point, 
and everything else is like a wheel. And that's that hub is the one point and the wheel has the spokes and those spokes are like fuses in Jesus' life. And as he is taking care of his family, that fuse is burnt out. And then as he says to fulfill the scriptures now, that fuse is burning out and it's all leading up to his final statement. It is finished. Even you can see this in the evening before the crucifixion scene. Jesus was focused on finishing in John chapter 17 in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed, I glorified you. This is this is John. This isn't uh, Mark or Matthew. So it's not the Garden of Gethsemane as far as I can tell. But he is praying and he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished. That's our word again. Finished. I have having finished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus knows that he's done what he's needed to do. It's, his life is leading up to this moment. If we do look at another gospel, Mark 14, 41, here he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says in, his, uh, in, in that garden, the hour has come. He knows that his time is finished. He has come to this world, to finish God's work. And the closer we get to Jesus' death, the closer we get to Jesus' finish line. The closer he gets to finishing that puzzle. What does it mean when Jesus says it is finished? And what does it mean for you and me? In John, Jesus' last Recorded words are rather short and clipped. In eight short words from the cross in the Gospel of John, Jesus supplies for the needs of his mother. In John, the next word is I thirst. And we mentioned last week that was just one word in the Greek. And this word this morning is just one word. With one word, he declares it is finished. Tetelestai, tetelestai, it is finished. It's a word in the Greek that was used similarly, but a little different depending on the context in the Greek. A servant, for example, would tell his master, tetelestai, it is finished, in order to say, I have completed the job you have given me to do. A priest, a high priest, would tell a Jew after having examined and accepting his sacrifice. He would say, tetelestai, it is finished, to say it is perfect, it is acceptable. A merchant would give a customer a receipt after paying, saying tetelestai, in order to say it has been paid in full. An artist, upon completing some great work of art, would step back and look at his work and with pride say, Tetelestai, to say it is completed and it is excellent. These are just some of the implications of what Jesus is saying when he says it is finished. One thing that is clear as you study that Jesus does not mean when he says it is finished. It is not a cry of defeat, but a shout of victory. It is finished. It is done. It is completed. It has been successful. I have paid the price. It is finished. The word has so many more implications and power when on Jesus' lips uttered from the cross than even in its common usage among the Greeks. It is the fulfillment of God's eternal purposes, His eternal plan of salvation. His death, finishing there on the cross, is the reason that He came. The Great Wall of China <clears throat> is considered to be not just the longest ever construction by length, but also in the time it took to complete that work. The wall's construction began in the 7th century BC, and it was lengthened and improved upon and built and added to for the next 2,000 years. 
It was began as a project, a much smaller project of perimeter defense, but it is not likely that when it was begun that the original builders had in mind the, the vast expanse or the number of years, the monumental scale that would be completed in the next hundreds of years. Some of the longest building projects that included plans with end goals are cathedrals. The Cologne Cathedral in Germany began with a definite plan in mind, but it took over 632 years to complete, to finish that building. Now that <clears throat> includes a 400 year gap there when there was a loss of interest and a loss of funds and there were several wars going on. But there are other cathedrals that didn't take quite as long. The St. Vitus Cathedral took 585 years. The Milan Cathedral took 579 years. And each one of those, though they took a long time uh, they, and they began with a plan, they still involved little tweaks and changes as time went by, changes from those original plans. Even today, if you plan to build something, if you have ever made a plan to build something and then gone about the task of building it, you realize that there are going to be changes to your original plan. That's why Lowe's is open to nine, <laughs> to late in the evening. That's why they're open on the weekends, because they know you're going to have to come back here over and over again as plans change and you find out you need new tools. There's only one plan that I know of that was carried out perfectly. God's plan for our salvation. Let's look at some passages here in regards to God's plan and the link and the complexity and yet the perfection. God chose us in Christ. That means that those in Christ are the ones who are chosen. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1.4. His Means of saving us, according to 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, his means of saving us is by the precious blood of Christ. And that passage says Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. God already had the plan back then. Revelation 13, 8 describes Jesus as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God's plan was carried out from, from the beginning, from before the beginning to the accomplishment, to when Jesus said, it is finished, according to God's specific specifications, every detail. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, 23, as he is giving that first gospel sermon, uh, that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, a definite plan is a plan that determines exactly what must be done? Every aspect of the building. A definite plan then is not one that can be changed along the way. Jesus carried out this definite plan. A plan that could not be given an extension in order to change the deadline. Everything Jesus did to fulfill God's plan was done to God's exacting specification. It was all done perfectly because of Jesus, God's plan of salvation for saving you and I was done to perfection. We see it. God knows it. And Jesus that day on the cross knew it too. And that's why he was hanging there on the cross. And that's why through that physical pain, through that ridicule, despite the torn flesh and the shortness of breath, Jesus finds the strength to say it is finished because nothing's going to keep him from that. From before creation, everything's been leading up to this moment. Nothing's going to keep him from saying, I have done it. It is finished. I have accomplished it. God's plan is done. In this moment, all creation hinges on what Jesus says in that moment as he accomplishes God's work. 
We learn a great, great deal here in this one word about the Lord that we serve. We learn a great deal about the shepherd we discover. And we discover as we follow him how he came to this moment, how he came to this moment where he was able to say, I have fulfilled what you wanted done. I have accomplished your plan. It is finished. Jesus can say this because he was completely surrendered to God's will and God's plan. If you turn over to John chapter 4, verse 23, we see Jesus' awareness once again of what he is doing, and we get a glimpse of his commitment to God's plan. There, as he is speaking to this Samaritan woman at the well, and she goes into town, his disciples come back, and they think he's hungry, and they, they want to give him food, and he says his food is to do God's will and to accomplish his work. Jesus is saying what sustains him is fulfilling God's purpose for him. In other words, the way Jesus sees it, in order for him to survive and grow and prosper, he must be doing God's will and finishing God's work. In Matthew chapter 4, as Jesus is being tempted, we have similar statements. We see there in verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Every word. That's exacting specifications. Jesus was aware of those words and he was aware of what he was doing throughout his life. Every word, literally, it is every utterance, every noise, every sound. In Deuteronomy, which is being quoted here in Matthew 4.4 4 by Jesus, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, as it is saying these same words, the, the, the literal explanation of this passage is that, that anything that comes out of God's mouth is what you are to live by. Jesus knew every word, every utterance, every sound that came out of God's mouth. He knew the plan and he stuck to it following that pattern exactly no matter what happened to him in his life. He knew what to do in no matter what situation because he knew God's word and he knew God's plan. Every board in the right position, every nail in the right place. He had to put his own desires aside. The more he learned to submit, the more he was able to follow God's plan. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. I'll read 7 through 9. <clears throat> In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son... He learned obedience. The word there can be translated submission. Although he was a son, he learned submission through what he suffered. Whatever happened to him in his life, he was able to suffer through it. He learned submission through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He, he tells us here how he was made perfect. And again, when we see this passage with this word perfect in our translations, it's taking a word and it can have the idea of perfection, as it certainly does here, but it also, when it's speaking of us, has the idea of maturity and completeness and accomplished. comes from the same root word as finished. Here, how was he made complete, finished, perfect? By obedience, through submission. How did he learn that obedience, that submission? He learned through what he suffered. 
he learned to surrender his will because no matter what he faced in life, he was willing to give up what he wanted to do, what he desired in order to do what God wanted. I believe the most vivid place we see this and what this passage is most likely referencing is what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 and following there. It says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then in verse 42, he prayed again, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. With loud cries and supplications in, in Hebrews, we read loud cries and, and tears to him who was able to save. Can you hear that as Jesus prays in Gethsemane? Can you hear the suffering, the very sorrowful, even to death, as Jesus says in this passage in, in Hebrews? Can you see the ultimate surrender and submission to God's design? Your will be done. Be done, finished, accomplished, complete. Your will be paid in full. Your will be perfect and excellent. And because Jesus finished, Hebrew says, because he finished, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. That includes us. I don't know if you noticed in Hebrews, Jesus learned obedience. And here we find our salvation through him by obedience. That salvation is for all who submit. For all who surrender, we can be complete in him. We can be made perfect in him. We can have our debt paid. Or again, another form of that word, we can finish the way that Jesus said, ah, it is finished. We can finish. We can live according to God's plan in Christ if we are willing to do what Christ did. Surrender. Scripture teaches that God has a plan, a plan of salvation, a plan that interacts with each one of us. God has a plan for every person, and that is for us to live according to everything that comes out of his mouth. Is it easy always? No. Even Jesus wrestled with this in the garden. Jesus wrestled with his own will. And the garden, he was praying that he would be willing to put his will aside. He was praying, telling God, I'm willing to surrender my will to yours. Jesus wrestled with his own will. I wonder, when we're faced with temptation, how often do we go to the Father in prayer as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane? See, he was sorrowful even to death. He knew what was coming and he knew it was going to be painful and he knew it was going to be difficult. We pray when we are facing, when we are suffering with health issues, when we are suffering the loss of a loved one. But I wonder if we pray like Jesus did for God's will to be done. Do we suffer sorrow like Jesus did in tears over sin? Do we go to God in prayer and tell him, help us surrender to you in sorrow, fearing 
What might happen if we are unwilling to surrender to our Father? What do we see Jesus doing in Gethsemane? He's learning submission. Do we go to God in prayer when tempted to learn submission? Jesus knew the beginning. Jesus knew his end from the beginning. Well, we, uh, we've talked about this uh, in our Wednesday night class. We've, had, uh, we've got an advertisement for Sunday, uh, Sunday morning Bible class, now an advertisement for Wednesday night Bible class. God always knows the end from the beginning, and Jesus knew the end from the beginning here. And we look at our lives and we say, well, Jesus knew what was going to happen. We don't. So how are we supposed to do what Jesus did? How are we supposed to learn submission if we don't know the end from the beginning? Well, guess what? We do know the end. We know God's plan of salvation. We know how to be in Christ. We know how to live like Christ. We can know the end from the beginning. And we live according to that when we follow Jesus' example. We can find preservation and fulfillment in accomplishing his word. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul is not Jesus. Paul is not God. And yet he was able to say, I have finished. How do you know, Paul? Because he knows God's word. And he has gone to him and surrendered his will to God. And Paul is not perfect. You and I are not perfect. But we are perfect in Christ. And Paul knows that he is in Christ. When he lives a life in obedience to him. We constantly need to go to God. What Jesus did on the cross forgives us of our sins. Past present, and future as we continue to walk in obedience. He knows that we will fail, but 1 John tells us if we go to him confessing our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins as we walk in the light. We must continue to give up our own will, surrender ourselves to him. Paul, here in this verse, we see he is able to finish and finish well. Why do we see that? It, he says, I was able to finish the race. I have kept the faith. See, he, he never lost sight of the end. He never lost sight of the fact that he was in a race. He was always looking around. And he was always striving to live that way. He was aware of no matter what would happen to him, whether good or bad. He was aware of God's word, and he was going to live out God's word no matter what he suffered. And by that, he learned obedience and was able to say, I've kept the faith. I've finished the race. And he encourages us to do the same. He tells us that we have the same plan laid out before us in Ephesians 2.10. There we're told we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You and I. Jesus created us. You and I. He came to live among us. He completely surrendered himself to God and finished God's plan for you and for me. And when he does that, when he finishes, he leads us to do the same thing that he did. Surrender ourselves to God. Because there we find sustenance. There we find life. There we find the way to eternal life. And we need to be aware of our surroundings and live like this every day. 
make it our goal every day to follow the plan and finish well so that we can hear our Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus on the cross finished God's plan of salvation. And in that word, we see so much. I see an invitation and a challenge and a command for us to do the same. To finish. To continue. To live according to God's word. According to God's will. No matter what comes our way. This morning we all face different things, don't we? Good things, bad things. How are you facing those things? Are you doing what God would have you do? If you don't know what God would have you do in that situation, are you studying his word? Are you praying? Are you going to him in prayer when you face temptation? When you're struggling in the depths of sin, are you going to God in prayer this morning? If you are in that place, are you willing to do what God advises and share with the church so that the church can build you up? So that the church can lift you up before God the Father and God the Son, and pray that your sins might be removed from you. This morning, if you have not, are you willing to put on Christ? Because only there can you find that accomplishment of Jesus on the cross to bring you eternal life. This morning, if you have a need, please come as we stand and sing.